right. Welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors, everyone. I'm Corey Janoff, joined as always by Rochelle Vanderzanden. Hello. And today we want to talk about kind of that slow and steady approach to growing your wealth. Uh, we got some, you know, plenty of examples. We'll bounce around a bit here, but uh, you know, the get rich quick scheme. You, know, you might see some of those headlines in the news about people that became overnight successes or started a company and are now billionaires. That's most likely not you for the average and even above average person. Um, you know, the way to accumulate wealth and riches, it, it takes time, it takes patience. Um, but totally different side tangent before we get into that topic, Rochelle. So I was at this restaurant over the weekend and it was the most unique experience for me. Um, I, well, for some people, this may be the norm. I don't go out to eat a ton. I got two young kids. It's like takeout from Chipotle is our, is our dinner out. Is this but, the whole QR code thing? So, okay. So it, it takes us a step further. So yeah, okay, you know, the okay, QR okay. code, a lot of places have, you know, scan the menu yeah. at the table, QR code. So I go there, you scan the menu. So you sit down, you know, someone brings out some waters, scan the menu. And not only do you see the menu on your phone, but you also order and pay from your phone. So you like pick what you want. It's kind of like ordering online, you know, for takeout, but you just like Corey, tap, this tap is the not thing. a new thing. This is a new thing for <laughs> this me. This is not a new thing. <laughs> but I feel like more restaurants should do it. Do this. You see a lot of places that are like, you know, we're closing early or we're only open yeah. these days, you know, staff shortages. We're hiring. Like this would solve so many hiring issues and staff shortage issues in this industry. You need like one bartender to make drinks, one person to run food, and then the kitchen. And you know, people order from their phones, bring it to the table, you know, clear it out. Like you don't need the whole wait staff. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I feel like you're normally like ahead of me when it comes to tech stuff and talking about chat, chat GPT. And I'm like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. But this is like something that's been around for a while. Like even during COVID, they started doing it because, you know, it was a way to do more social distancing. Like if you don't have as much face-to-face -face interaction between your staff and your customers, like there's less of issues of those kinds of things. But I, I think a lot of brew pubs do it. Like it's really common in places like that. But there's also like a little bit of a backlash against it because people feel like it takes out, you know, the the personal interactions of going out to eat and like having someone serve you and things like that. But you're right. Like if you don't have enough employees, like obviously that's an easy way to solve that problem. I mean, you can still interact with the person that brings you the food, but it was like, we sat down, we didn't have to wait. We ordered stuff. Like it came out five minutes later. Mm -hmm. like it, it was very efficient, quick. Yep. And you can order as you go. It's like you order yeah. three things and then you want to order two more. Like exactly. it may even upsell, like, because you don't have to wait you don't have to wait for your wait staff to come and take your order. So maybe you order more things. Yeah. Like every single sports bar should do this on Sundays yeah. in the fall and Saturdays in the fall. Like you're, they're packed, you know, order. People are going to be there for potentially three hours. Like, well, we went through those wings quickly and it's not even halfway through the first quarter. I guess we'll order some more. So, yeah. Love anyways, it. I'm on to something maybe five years too late, but whatever. It's uh, I feel like that could be expanded to other businesses as well. Um, so anyways, um, back to the topic rich, at ham. Yeah. Getting rich <laughs> slowly, uh, rather than getting your food quickly, uh, which mm -hmm. is the most important thing to me when I go out to eat. Um, I'm not there for a long time. I'm there for a good time, but today we're going to talk about investing for a long time, not investing for a good time. If you're looking for a good time with your investments, um, you, you, you've come to the wrong place and, and, you know, go to a casino if you want to have fun with money. But uh, investing should be the opposite of fun. It should be boring, slow, not exciting at all. So where do we mm -hmm. want to start, Rochelle? We're going to talk about some super random examples of kind of slow and steady wins the race. <laughs> Very random. And I love it. And the first one we're going to talk about is Greenland sharks. And this is the first time I've heard anything about them. This is brand new to me. I don't know if everyone else already knows about these creatures. And I'm just the only one that's out of the loop. But they live forever. Their average lifespan is like between 250 and 500 years. They're huge. 
they grow very, very slowly and have like a really low metabolism, but they grow maybe like a quarter to a half an inch per year. They don't even reach sexual maturity until around 150 years old. So they don't reproduce until then, which is crazy. Like you, like they don't die until then so they can reproduce later, but they're more or less immune to a lot of cancers and diseases and things like that, partially because of the super slow metabolism, also because they live in very, very cold water. Um, and it's just a really good example of how like, you know, you could grow slowly, take your time. They move slowly, which is really interesting. It's like everything about these creatures is slow. And yet because of that, they have this longevity and this success that you don't see in a lot of other species or, you know, at least, you know, species with higher metabolisms that eat more and things like that. They don't have that kind of lifespan period, which is really interesting. Maybe giant tortoises are another one that live hundreds of years, you know, super slow to grow, move, everything. Um, you know, obviously immune to many ailments, diseases that, you know, would get most creatures on the planet. You know, mm-hmm. humans aren't the only animals that get diseases. Um, so, yeah, maybe there's something to be said about taking it slow. Your your body is is, is structured more ideally to withstand the elements Mm-hmm. We can't of, really do that. <laughs> no, we're trying. Yeah. Speaking of trying to perfect your 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 body and uh, and becoming um, immune to to many things, so pro athletes, you know, there, there's a lot of parallels between fitness and finance. Um, and I think one of the the most interesting things about well, there's a lot of interesting things about professional athletes compared to amateur athletes, but the training regimen, um, it, you know if you and I are going to try and go work out Rochelle, it's often like, Oh, you got to go work up a sweat, go intense. You know, if you're no pain, no gain, yada, 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 but pro athletes. And for anyone that's done power zone training, like you spend a lot of time at very low intensities. It it almost looks like you're just going through the motions. You're not really pushing yourself, but they do it every single day. It's the hours. Con- <laughs> it's the consistency and they take the rest seriously. And, you know, there's nutrition and stretching and massage, you know, there's the whole round the clock training that they do. But I think the most interesting part is rather than just pushing themselves to the max, every time they go out there, it's, it's, it's lower intensity, but consistent and persistent over time. Like if you're training for a marathon, you don't try and run as far or fast as possible every single day. You got your, your, you know, lower speed runs, you know, shorter runs. And then, you know, maybe once a week you do your intense, um, push yourself training or, or, you know, you, you keep your, your, the majority of your training period slow. And the last few minutes you're, you're pushing yourself depends on the sport, depends on what you're training for, you know, whether it's running, whether it's cross country skiing, whether you're a basketball player, football, but whatever, um, it's the, it's the repetition, the consistency and, and, you know, letting your body not overdoing it. Cause if you overdo it, you're going to have injuries, you're going to burn out and, and, you know, you're ultimately going to fail. You know, you need your body to last, you need your brain and mind to last, uh, for a long period of time. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you're trying to accumulate wealth. Like it takes a while. You, if you're pushing yourself too hard, you're going to burn out and fail. Same with your career. If you're working 80 hours a week, it's, you're gonna burn out eventually. You can't do it forever. Not sustainable. Even if the healthcare administrators, you know, try and make you, it's it's not possible. (laughs) So bringing it back to personal finance, I think Warren Buffett is a really good example of doing exactly this, you know, but he's been investing for 80 plus years. Um, he's been good at it, but the time is really what matters most. You know, he is really famous for being such a part of Vanguard and like, you know, it's index funds. It's not, it's not that exciting. (laughs) And 99% of his net worth has been accumulated since his 55th birthday. So slow and steady, like up to that point. Yeah, he was, he had wealth, you know, he had earned money up to that point, but it really is that time and consistency that's more important than anything else. 85% of his wealth has actually come after he turned age 66, even Um, his business partner, Charlie Munger was the one that said that the first rule of compounding interest is to never interrupt it unnecessarily. 
So if you are making big changes, if you're trying to chase the next best best thing, it's going to be really, really counterproductive for most people. Like it's very unusual that people are actually successful doing that. And that's the thing that can be exciting because if you do and you do it successfully, then obviously, you know, maybe you get that dopamine hit that you get when you're gambling and you want to replicate that for multiple reasons, because you got money and also because it was exciting. But realistically, most of the time, you're just going to need to be consistent and steady. Yeah, Buffett and Munger, they you know rarely sell any of their positions. They'll buy a company and let the managers keep running it the way they run it. And they just hold on to it. And, you know, they invest in good companies at a fair price. And, you know, they, they just you know, reap the rewards from it over the ensuing decades. And I don't know if, if Buffett has invested much in Vanguard himself, but I believe he has instructed in his estate plan to basically put 90% of his wealth that goes to his heirs into a or to his wife into an S&P 500 index fund with Vanguard, preferably, um, mm-hmm. just because it's simple, it's easy. You know, he's not going to be around to manage the, um, you know, the portfolio of stocks anymore that he's overseen through Berkshire Hathaway. But, uh, but you know, it, it's it's basically set it and forget it. And like Munger said, don't interrupt it unnecessarily. It, your investments will have ups and downs. I can guarantee you, you will see your portfolio decrease in value often. You know, every single year, <laughs> if, if you're checking often enough, like. Weekly, it will go down in value. It's it, it's not an escalator. It's a roller coaster ride. Um, you know, but as long as there's people on this planet, we need to eat. We need to buy things. We're going to restaurants and scanning QR codes to order our food. Like there's transactions happening, so therefore there's opportunities for businesses to deliver goods and services to customers, and therefore opportunities for investors in those businesses to benefit. So really you know keep that in mind when you're investing. You're not investing in Vanguard. You're not investing in a Roth IRA. You know those are just wrappers that hold the money for you, but your actual investments are invested in the great companies of America and the rest of the world and those businesses are what are delivering value for you over time and hopefully those businesses will continue to generate revenue and profits for you as a shareholder to ultimately benefit from whether that's in the form of the company growing in size or in the form of just profit distributions from the company they're profitable they distribute dividends you make money you reinvest those dividends to grow your portfolio size and it compounds uh, moving forward as a result. Simple as that. You know, more complicated, but but the, <laughs> at, at the core, you know, that that's all that it is. So. Yeah, absolutely. There's another example of not rushing wealth, um, but Corey was writing about an interview that he'd once heard with Darius Rucker from Hootie and the Blowfish. I don't know if anyone... Like Corey, I'm surprised you even know who Hootie and the Blowfish is. I feel this like that was, was back in the '90s. I didn't really. <laughs> I wasn't super into music then. Obviously, you know Darius Rucker's had a good, you know, multifaceted career. He's went gone right. from Hootie and the Blowfish and now a, a country singer. Um, you know, he's been famous for what probably 30 plus years now at this yeah. point. Yeah. But yeah. When he was with, and and the interview I heard w- was a more recent one. This wasn't back in the '90s, but you know he he remember he was recalling a story it might have actually been on the dan patrick show because he's a, a frequent guest on that show if you listen to sports mm. talk radio but um he was asked once what it's you know when hootie and the blowfish first came on the scene in what the mid 90s or whatever it was you know what's it feel like to be an overnight an overnight sensation and his answer i'm paraphrasing and you know because i don't have the quote in front of me but he, he basically replied you know if you call traveling in a van or he's like you call traveling in a van staying in cheap hotels to play in dirty bars for 20 years and overnight sensation then but the point is like that's what it takes you know it's not like yeah i mean sure you might see an article about someone who puts a song up on youtube and gets a record deal and becomes famous but but most of these artists they're grinding for years and years and years before they get their big break whether it's in music and film and, you know, it's it, most people just aren't instantly great at a craft. You know, it's the 10,000 hours rule. You got to, you know, practice your your craft for 10,000 hours before you can become 
excellent at it. So mm -hmm. they were working hard and they finally got their break, but it was after, you know, a long, you know, persistent, consistent effort. Mm -hmm. And it, it didn't happen overnight. Yep. And there's lots of like examples of the opposite too. You know, like you look at some tech companies in recent years where, you know, they don't even have a profit yet, but their stock prices are skyrocketing. It's just, they're hiring everyone. They're trying to grow as fast as they can. And then it doesn't work out. They never turn a profit and you see their stock plummet and they have to lay off people. Um, and that, you know, there's lots of different examples and it doesn't mean that none of those companies will be successful. It just means that that is not always the way to be successful. And it's not a sure thing. Like none of it is. Um, I think there's other examples where like lots of growth companies, sure, they invest a lot. They try to grow quickly. But even Amazon that we think of as like a staple, like Amazon will always make money. They're never going to not make money. That's what people think. That's not what I'm necessarily saying. But they didn't first turn a profit until 2003, which was nine years after they were founded. Which nine years isn't like the longest time, but it's more than you would expect. You know, it was quite a, fi a while. It, it took some effort to get them to the point where they were actually turning a profit. And now, you know, they make a lot of money and their shareholders generally make a lot of money. Not every year. Like obviously most stock has down years sometimes, down days, down weeks, but their stock price has increased enormously since that time. Yeah, now they're everywhere, including mm -hmm. on our front doorstep weekly. Or... On our TV, like yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on our TV, just finished watching the last episode of Mrs. Maisel. Great show. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. I won't tell you. Um, <laughs> apparently, Ted Lasso just ended too. So we're recording yeah. this end of May. So you'll probably hear this in like June or July. So we're this might seem outdated, but uh, but yeah, Succession just ended too. But oh my um, gosh, it's an end of an era. End of an era, but yeah, no, the <laughs> it, it, it patience, you know, old growth forests take hundreds of years, sometimes thousands of years to ultimately grow to maturity and, and resemble, you know, what they do resemble. Um, yeah, the, the Amazon, there's plenty of examples of companies, you know, taking, taking their sweet time to, to become what they are. Whereas the overnight sensations, you know, the quicker you rise, the quicker you can fall. If you don't have that stable foundation built under you, kind of like going back to the pro athletes and training, you got to work those lower intensity zones before, you know, in order to ultimately succeed at the higher intensities. And like, you know, another great example, probably the buzzword this year is AI, artificial intelligence. Every single company out there is mentioning AI as part of their business and their future. And everyone's ears perk up when they do and their stock price pops as a result. But I'm going to go out on a limb and guarantee that many of these <laughs> AI companies will flounder and fail. Not all of them. You know, AI will definitely be a part of our future. It already is. You know, artificial intelligence is everywhere. You know, just go on Instagram. Your photos are automatically filtered by their, you know, their their technology. That's an artificial intelligence right there for you. Um, you know, Photoshop apps been around for decades. That's artificial intelligence. You click the like automatic make my picture look prettier button. And uh, you know, or on your iPhone, the quick edit magic wand button, boom. You know, all, you know, AI is everywhere. Um, you know, the extent of what it's going to turn into and become, who knows? It's everyone, anyone's guess. Uh, but it's you know, not all the companies will be a success. Um, you know, the ones that that are here to stay probably are going to take a while to to build and grow. But you know, it's kind of like the cryptocurrency from a couple years ago, or you know, that was the the topic du jour. And not all of them were successful, you know, and many of them will be unsuccessful. There might be a few staples that stick around. Who knows what cryptocurrency is going to look like in the future um, or, or if it'll even be a part of our world. And I think the uh, the blockchain technology, you know, will, will be around in, in what form, how it'll be monetized. Don't know. But um, but yeah, the whole point is you can't rush wealth, you know, getting rich mm -hmm. quick. Sure, you might get lucky. You might win the lottery. But for most of you, it's it's not going to happen. So let's not force the issue and try and force it to happen faster than it's you know than it, than, it, than it's whatever than God intended for you. Yep. Yeah, I think it's important just to remember that getting the best returns is not the goal. Like, because 
if you're invested in a way where you can get the best returns, you can also take some pretty substantial losses, like more so than if you have a, a well-diversified portfolio. So the goal is really more like somewhat mediocre and consistent returns over time, which sounds boring and crazy. But the key is also that it's over a long time, you know, like giving an average of seven to 10 percent per year. Like if you're only invested for three or four years, that's not very much money, even if you consistently got that seven to 10 percent every year. But, you know, you give it decades and that adds up to a much larger return with that cumulative interest. Like that's really powerful. So, and most people looking for the best returns don't end up getting them, you know, like they chase returns and end up being pretty unsuccessful. And those more exciting investments are inherently more risky and that's why they're exciting. It's things like the small innovative companies like that next big, like which, which AI company do we think is going to be the one that like really takes it all over or one of, you know, one of the handful that's really successful. And do we look and try to like pick it and then be like, we're going to put all our money in that company because that company is going to be the best at AI. And your guess may or may not be correct. You're taking a big risk. There's inherently like a large return potential, but also like the potential of them going out of business entirely because they just get edged out of the market. So there's, yeah. In order to get outsized returns, you have to go against the grain. You have to zig when everyone else zags. You have to go left when everyone else is going right. You Mm -hmm. have to, to, to take big risks, take a contrarian approach. And there's a reason it's a contrarian approach. Not, you know, most people don't think that's going to work. And in many cases, it won't. But on the few mm-hmm. that it does, that's where you're going to see those outsized returns. So that's where like venture capitalists and um, angel fund investors, they fully expect that nine out of 10 of their investments will fail. Well, you know, it might be like seven out of 10 will fail, two will return what they put in, and one is going to hit the home run. So if they mm-hmm. invest in a hundred different companies, you know, one or two of them are, are actually going to you know, give them their, their results, a handful, Mm -hmm. you know, might make a couple bucks and then, you know, another handful, you know, you might get your money back, but the rest they're going to fail. And, and that's the, you know, diversification in that world. They expect to lose all their money on most of their investments, but there's going to be a few that hit it out of the park for you guys. You know, we're not quite in that world. So, you know, we can't quite operate like that. Um, I think the other thing is that like, it's really possible to be successful once or twice doing this. Like, it doesn't mean you're not ever going to pick the right company to put a bunch of money in. Like you could potentially, but I think that that one-time success tends to make people very overconfident. It's like, oh yeah, I could totally do this. I'm great at this. I made all this money on this one investment or, you know, investing in that one cryptocurrency or whatever it was. And then you think you can replicate that that success, that financial success, that feeling over time. And it's hard to duplicate. Like, even if you do it once, like the chance of you doing that repeatedly over time is very, very low. And, you know, you can lose even more money because you have that sense of overconfidence at that that point. You have to really think about like who you are buying investments and who else is buying investments because it's like you and the mutual fund managers and the investment bakers of the world and, you know, all of these different companies that have so much more in resources than you do. Like you're the little fish. So it's really hard to be successful at that over time. And can you stomach seeing the majority of your investments go belly up and you not seeing a return on your money? Like Mm -hmm. it takes a certain one, it takes a certain level of wealth to be able to invest a meaningful sum to where if it does hit, it's going to be a a worthwhile success for you. You know, if you're only putting a thousand dollars in and it has a, you know, thousand percent return. Great. You get $10,000 back. It's not changing any of your lives. Um, you know, if you put a hundred thousand in and it turns into a million, great, but you got to do a hundred thousand, a hundred times in order to get that one that turns into a million. Like it's not the, the it's, you know, the math isn't in your favor. Mm-hmm. You have, most of you, if you're listening to this and you have tens of millions of dollars to throw around at these investments, like you're not listening to this podcast. I can promise you. <laughs> You're already financially independent. Um, yeah. But, yeah. 
<laughs> when you are taking that boring approach, it it's not exciting, you know, and it also in times it just feels like nothing is happening. Like, especially if you're checking your accounts all the day, like you might see like slight movements, but it doesn't really feel like your wealth is growing sometimes when you're taking this fairly moderate approach. And sometimes it's not, you know, it, it can make sense when the market is down to put more money in the market. But if the market continues to go down, it doesn't look like you put any money in the market and that doesn't feel great. Like it's not the best feeling of the world. But if you have 25, 30 years, more than that, potentially, and you're consistent, it will like it'll pay off in the long run, generally. So I think watching your investments daily can be like watching paint dry, or like trying to make sure your kettle is boiling or something like that. It can also be, you know, for some people, anxiety inducing if you're really caught up on the the small movements up and down on a daily basis so maybe don't check it every day like that might not be the most useful thing to do with your time so there's lots of other things that you can do read a book take a walk yeah and it, it does like this is why we do net worth statements for all of our clients and update them and our review meetings you know a couple times a year it's because over longer periods of time, that's where you start to see those changes more pronounced. Like we'll, we'll, I'll often have a meeting with clients. They feel like, oh, I feel like we're in a rut. We're not going anywhere. Our investments aren't growing. We're not making progress. And they'll be like, well, hey, let's look back a few years. Look at your net worth. You know, five years ago, it was 500,000. Today, it's one and a half million. You're doing something right because your net worth is growing. It may not feel like it, but you're definitely moving in the right direction. So that's where yeah. you got to take that step back and really take a broader look. When you're like in the trenches, looking at things in the moment, it may not feel like you're making any progress, but then when you really take a step back and look, it's like, oh yeah, look where we were way back then compared to today, we have made a lot of progress and pat yourself on the back for it. And yeah. Keep, 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 keep it going. And if you didn't do that previously, if you haven't like benchmark, benchmarked like where you're at, do it now. You know, like figure out where you're at now. And I think, you know, and you check it five to 10 years from now, that'll feel really good. Sometimes you can like reverse engineer and kind of figure out where you were five years ago, but that's really hard if you didn't do it at the time. So, you know, make it easy for yourself and do it now and, and see what it looks like in a few years. Yeah, absolutely. So I think to maybe wrap things up, a, a fun math example, because I like numbers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, the whole point of slow and steady wins the race, the, you know, time in the market is more important than timing the market, you know, add cliche or anecdote, whatever story here. But um, like if you're averaging 8% a year on your investments, which that doesn't mean you're going to get 8% a year. It means over a long period of time, when you divide the total return by the number of years, it could average eight, could be more, could be less, who knows, can't predict the future. Stock market's a roller coaster. One year you'll be up 20%. Next year you're down 12%. Sure, the average between those two years was eight, but you were nowhere near eight in either of those years. So don't get caught up in, in fixating on a return average because you're never going to hit the average um, in a given year or even several years stretch. It's going to, you know, over a long period of time, it'll average out, but you're going to have a wide range of outcomes from one year to the next. So, anyways. If you want to accumulate a million dollars, which you know many of you probably will need more than that to ultimately retire and live the life that you want to live, but just to keep it simple, round number, million dollars at 8% a year, if you start investing now and want to get there 10 years from now, you're going to need to start investing $5,500 a month, roughly, in order to accumulate a million dollars a decade from now. If you've got 15 years to work with, you're only going to need to invest $2,900 per month to accumulate your million at 8% a year. If you give yourself 20 years of time to get that million, $1,700 a month will get you there. Over 30 years, like if you're in your, if you're just starting your career now and you want to have a million dollars by your 60s, $671 a month is all you need. You know, that's like a little bit more than maxing out your Roth IRA each year not a lot of money, but it'll grow over 30 years to approximately a million dollars at 8% a year average. If you give yourself 40 years, you know, like if you 
start working or start saving in your 20s, you know, when you're in residency and you're work and you keep doing it into your 60s, you only need $287 per month to accumulate a million dollars. And then 50 years, like say you start a Roth IRA for your kids when they're, you know, starting making a couple bucks doing whatever, you know, they earn some income, whether it's household chores that you pay them for a reasonable wage, or they, you know, work part-time in high school, $126 a month over 50 years will get you to a million. So yeah, the, the time piece is that key ingredient. Uh, you, you can try and accelerate things, uh, but, but you can't accelerate time. So, you know, you can, you can only save so much. So if, I guess you can't go back in time, obviously, but the sooner you start, the better. Um, and and just consistent, persistent over a long period of time will, will lead to incredible results. Just average returns over, repeated over a long period of time will lead to above average results. Like a million dollar net worth is four times the average in this country for you know retirees, basically. So it's... Uh, I think not counting your your home value, but um, but yeah, it, it, it's time is the key ingredient. You know, teach your your kids, your you know younger colleagues. You know, the start sooner, the sooner rather than later. Um, you know, don't wait till a certain point in time or a certain benchmark. Start yesterday. Just make mm-hmm. it happen. Yep. And it's hard. To, I think sometimes people just want to wait until it's easy, but it's never easy. You know, you're setting aside some of your money and not spending it. And sometimes I, that can be a really hard choice, but it's for future you. Yeah. It's saving for... an appropriate amount should be slightly uncomfortable. Like that means <laughs> you're saving an adequate amount. If it's a very comfortable amount to save, you're not saving enough. It's going to take, you won't ever be. Or able maybe to save. you're not spending a lot and that's okay. Yeah. I mean, you know. What either way, but still it should be, you know, it should feel like, man, there could be other things we could do this with this money now that we want to do. Um, and, and I don't mean like, you know, pinch pennies and never do anything fun. I'm just saying it should be slightly uncomfortable. You're prioritizing savings. Um, you know, it's not super uncomfortable, just a tiny bit or you can kind Mm -hmm. of feel it. (laughs) If you can't feel it, you're not saving enough. Um, you can feel it a little bit, then you know, you're doing it right. Awesome. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. If you ever have questions about Greenland sharks or anything like that, let us know. Or check out Animal Planet. Shark Week's coming up. Woo. (laughs) In July, right? I don't Uh, know. Haven't watched that in (laughs) decades, but used to be a favorite as a kid. There we go. All right. See you next time. Bye.